Good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening. We will just give people two more minutes and then I'll introduce the speaker and we can start um, the Congress. So let's just give two minutes for more people to join. Thank you. Good evening, colleagues. Welcome to the Congress, um, our virtual annual Congress for the Zimbabwe Dental Association, the theme of which is clinical dentistry in the 21st century. I'd like to introduce our first speaker who's opening our Congress. We're very excited to have one of our own to be opening the Congress this year. We've got Dr. Wayne Manana, who will be presenting to us a bit about the speaker, did his BDS at the UZ and went on to do some courses in implantology. He's a fellow of head and neck oncology and he did uh, microvascular reconstructive surgery. He's a full-time lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe, a philanthropist who works um, doing cleft surgery. Um, he also has done microvascular reconstructive surgery and he rotated at Harvard Medical School and Peking University. Today, he'll be discussing part two of the common pitfalls in wisdom teeth surgery, 101 disasters from the masters. Over to you, Dr. Manana. Manana? Dr. Manana, can you hear us? Oh, so sorry, I was on mute. Eh? Uh, yes, you are on mute. Yes, you can proceed now. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Vicky, for the introduction. I feel so much honored to be the, the first speaker of this uh, Congress. Huh? And we are basically continuing from where we left uh, last time, where we are discussing some of the challenges that we encounter in third molar surgeries and uh, where possible, we'll look at how we can mitigate or avoid some of these challenges. Huh? So please note that uh, this presentation is not meant to, to scare us, but it's meant to, to help us to be ready to as, as we encounter some of these challenges in third molar surgery. So we, we, we are looking at uh, some of the challenges that we encounter, as I mentioned. Uh, so I will immediately start by looking at a very common condition in, in, in Africa. Uh, so there are certain conditions that we call uh, benign fibro osseous lesions of the jaws. Huh? Uh, I know most of us left dental school many years ago and we probably have forgotten about these. Huh? 
but uh, this is a group of conditions where the, the bone density changes. Huh? And uh, one of them is something called FCOD. Huh? Uh, Dr. Chikosi, the pathologist, usually likes to call it the yellow bone. Huh? So FCOD is an abbreviation for fluorid cement osseous dysplasia, uh, which basically is, if you see the, the the encircled red zone. Um, so this is a, a 53 year old female patient that I saw uh, some few weeks ago. Uh, they actually had been scheduled for uh, disimpactions of the upper wisdom teeth. Uh, so, the, the, so if you look at the two eight, the, the temptation is this is a mobile tooth. Uh, uh, but once if you extract it, one of the things that happens is you see a yellow bone, like what you are seeing there, or sometimes if you are fortunate, uh, the bone is exposed and you would almost think that it's a tooth. Uh, so we, we, we should be careful because an extraction or a disimpaction of this, you, you end up taking out most of the, of the, of the maxilla. Uh, as you can see, this is actually bone sequestra that is separated from the rest of the, of the maxilla. Um, so how do we avoid this? It's, it's, it's very important that uh, we, we do basic investigations like a panorex, uh, so that can help us to, to avoid some of these challenges. Uh. And sometimes you, you, you look at a patient and you realize that the wisdom tooth is, is mobile and you think this is, a very easy tooth to, to extract, huh? but uh, that can also be a potential disaster. So this is a young patient uh, who presented with mobile uh, molars huh? and, and an extraction will lead to persistent infections. And sometimes there will be a fistula connecting to this multicystic uh, radiolucent lesion within the body of the mandible. So again, uh, the way to avoid some of these uh, complications is to, to make it a standard that we do not do wisdom or third molar surgery without uh, the very minimum epanorexa. And uh, the image that we are seeing here is a dentigerous sister. So if you do an intraoral periapical, you, you miss the huge unilocular radiolucence now that is extending even below the, the, the premolars and molars. And the, the, one of the disasters that I have seen frequently is uh, a lot of us, when we see a patient like this, we think the success of the treatment is based on extracting the tooth. Yet, if you extract the tooth, you would have actually opened a can of worms huh? because there is going to be an opening into the cyst, which is a big hollow cavity within the mandible, and there is going to be a persistent infection. Huh? Um, so the way to, to, to manage this patient properly would be to do the wisdom tooth, which is just 5% of what needs to be done. But more importantly, the cyst has to be enucleated. Huh? So this is a very common disaster in third molar surgery. Uh, one controversial area uh, in, in wisdom teeth is uh, uh, whether to, to, to do the procedure under strict uh, guidelines, WHO guidelines of infection control by wearing gowns, by wearing surgical gloves, or is there any difference between uh, performing third molar surgery with just our, so this box, uh, the, the gloves that we normally use are, are just clean gloves, huh? as opposed to sterile gloves that are ribbed, or uh, they actually come autoclaved. Huh? Are we supposed to, to wear these or, or just the clean gloves? Huh? Uh, or to, to, uh, to specify this further, uh, what type of regalia are we supposed to? So if you visit certain centers uh, in different continents, some people would wear 
uh, a war gown scrub in and wear all these gloves, huh? uh, sterile gloves, or some people just uh, wear sterile gloves. Huh? This is myself and my colleague, Dr. Silas. Huh? Um, or why don't, is there any difference if we do the procedure um, just wearing clean gloves as a chair side uh, and our routine lab coats? Huh? Um, so there, is a, there are several studies that have been done as randomized control trial uh, to, to, to evaluate if there is any difference in outcome uh, between those between those two. So there's a very big study that was done at Philippe Dental Hospital from October 2002 to September 2003, where they looked at health patients. Health patients are regarded as ASA class one, which is American Society of Anesthesiologists. The, these are patients without any disease. So they looked at non-smokers, people who don't drink, and they were doing third molar surgeries. Huh? And they excluded uh, patients who were taking antibiotics huh? or who required prophylaxis because of certain maybe valvular heart diseases, prosthetic joints. Huh? So what they did is they, they, they put those patients in two categories. And huh? one category, they were just using sterile gloves huh? And the, uh, and the other category, they were using clean gloves. Huh? So these guys were very thorough. So what, what they, they did before they, they conducted the study is they, they actually took the gloves and they took some swabs from the gloves. Huh? So we just forget about the entire table and focus on this column. Huh? So they, on the sterile gloves, they, they realized that uh, most of them on the, they, on the anaerobic species, uh, they realized that there was uh, one bacterial count of, uh, uh, it was positive for one. And then on clean gloves, uh, uh, you notice that, in fact, let's just go to the total. Uh, so the total bacterial count uh, that we would find on sterile gloves, according to their study was one, and on clean gloves, uh, just even before starting to use them, there were seven uh, in terms of bacterial count after they did the, the, the culture. They also looked at the, so this is anaerobic, they also grew the aerobic and they realized that for the clean gloves, there were 42, uh, the bacterial count, yet the bacterial count for clean gloves was only one. So this is before the procedure, and they were even thorough to went as far as they looked at the dental sockets for for the two categories, huh? and they they did they took some swabs huh? for the sterile category uh, anaerobics. Uh, so what is interesting that there was not much of a difference between the bacterial count huh? between uh, the sterile glove cate category of 20 patients versus the clean gloves it was 78 versus 77 uh, for the anaerobic and for the aerobic they they grew 59 for sterile and 63 uh. so what 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 then that basically means uh, is uh, in fact before i i make a conclusion they also uh, evaluated all the patients uh, in the two categories and they realized that there was normal healing uh, in up to 86% for the clean glove and 90% 90 for the sterile. And uh, the incidence of infections where uh, the acute infection was 2.2% for clean gloves and 0 0.7, and the dry socket was 0.7% for the clean glove and 0% for the, for the sterile gloves. So before we draw the, in fact, based on these results, the, the, they realized that there was no statistically significant difference between using clean gloves and 
sterile gloves. Huh? Although the sample size for this study is, is, quite, is quite small, but there are also lessons from people who perform a hand surgery. And uh, they, they also could not find any substantial evidence to support the use of number one, a main operating room sterility practices such as head covers, gowns, full patient draping, like covering the whole patient, using specialized airflow within the rooms and footwear to reduce surgical site infections in skin and minor hand surgery. So in other words, for, for hand surgery, what they realized is even if you perform the surgery in your office wearing clean gloves, huh, there was no difference. Huh? Uh, so the conclusion is there is no difference in complication rate between wearing sterile gloves and clean gloves huh, for third molar surgery. So it's not a disaster to be found uh, just wearing, because I know if you visit some centers, they are very obsessed about wearing uh, sterile gloves. Or, but uh, an important caveat here is in both categories, we, we still have to observe the standard WHO aseptic protocols. Uh, what does that mean? It means uh, in as much as we, we wear uh, clean gloves, uh, not sterile gloves for, for third molar surgery, we should, number one, we should not be touching our gowns with the gloves, we should not be touching light handles. Uh, we should be scrubbing our hands to the elbow level. We should uh, uh, not be touching any other surfaces. Uh, so the operator and the assistant should not touch any other surface within the room so that we, particularly in this era of COVID, uh, we, we can eat or not only COVID, but uh, even spore forming bacteria can be transmitted from surfaces. So we don't touch our mask. We, we, we don't touch anything uh, in third molar surgery. Uh. So therefore we can extrapolate the same. The question is, can, can we extrapolate the same to other oral surgical procedures like implantology? Uh, so we, we would then need to do uh, maybe a study to compare uh, something like a small randomized control trial. I don't know what we are doing in our surgeries when we do implants. Are we wearing just the standard clean gloves or we are wearing uh, sterile gloves? Huh? Um, so the, the flip designs, huh? uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting that uh, we, 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 we have seen very radical flips, some of them that are a, a bit worrisome. Uh, so, so the flap that is raised when we do third molar surgery is called a mucoperiosteal flap because it, it includes the mucosa and the periosteum right on the bone. Uh, what is important, the principles are the incision should not be performed on bone defects or cut the muscle or tendon. So remember the, the, the temporalis muscle attaches to the coronoid process uh, with an extension uh, to the anterior border of the ramasa. So when we do the, most of the flaps, especially if we cut distal to the tooth, you will see some of these fibers uh, of the muscles. Uh, uh, but we should not cut the muscle. Uh, and uh, it should not be too long. Huh? You should just get enough exposure to be able to perform the procedure. Um, and uh, the release incision into the sulcus should not go too deeper. Remember, there is a nerve in the, uh, I will show you what we mean by release incision. But remember, there is a nerve which is called the long back hour. Uh, so another disaster is if you, particularly this flap, if you go too deep from the uh, mobile mucosa or an attached gingiva, uh, you, you, you might end up cutting the long back out never. And uh, we, they, 
they should be minimal descents after suturing uh, and a good flap should minimize post-op pain, uh, edema, uh, dry socket, and it should allow for drainage of the socket. Huh? So the, the commonest, these are the two commonest flaps that uh, are used in third molar surgery. So this is called the triangular flap, and this is called the, the envelope flap. Uh, so the, the, the design is uh, you, you make a release incision. Uh, so this is the release incision, and then paragingiva or within the sulcus depth of the tooth, and then with an extension there uh, towards the distal. Uh, and then you raise with your periosteal elevator onto the bone. Um, so the envelope flap is, the only difference is you are not making a, a releasing incision, but please note that there are so many incisions. Huh? So there are as many incisions as there are surgeons. Huh? Um, and uh, so look at all these uh, and they date as far back as uh, in the early 19, like 1930, 1940 something, all these are. Huh? And uh, some of them are for the upper wisdom uh, tooth. Uh, so, but more or less, they, 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 look the, they look the same. Look at all these, uh, the Kruger one, like for the upper wisdom tooth uh, and all these different designs. Uh. But as, as I said, to simplify our life, uh, this, these are the two commonest incisions. And I would think you would never go wrong with these two, huh? but uh, you are allowed to introduce uh, your own type of incision. Huh? Uh, look at this. Huh? Uh, so commonly for the upper wisdom tooth, you'd go to the second, this is the commonest one. So the triangular maxillary incision where you, so you should avoid this one where you, you go distal to the, Remember, we are doing a disimpaction of a tooth up here. So if you make an incision here, the access will be very difficult. So try to come a, a bit mesial to, to the upper second molar. It gives you better exposure. So all these are different types of flap designs. And uh, so as I said, for an ideal flap design, all lines of, of incision should be located on sound bone. Uh, nevertheless, most designs don't follow this rule with the incisions uh, ending up being on the bone defect created by extraction of the socket. And uh, this will eventually cause a mucosal descent. So what, what are we saying here? You remember, Eventually, when you suture, you are pulling the back of mucosa on top of the socket so that it's not supported from below. So there is no foundation. Huh? Uh, and that can cause uh, the essence or delayed wound healing. So out of all these flaps, which is the best flap uh, designer? So different authors agree that uh, the the type of flap is not important. Instead, there are other more important factors when we do third molar surgery. As long as the flap is not, is not, as long as you are not creating or inventing your own flap, if we stick to the basic ones, most of the times the outcome will not be influenced by the flap designer. Dolan Mans uh, et al, they inferred that the degree of impaction, nicotine consumption, and the duration of the, of the surgery have more influence on primary healing of the wound than the flap designer. And in another study by Sadu et al, they found that there is no difference in the degree of inflammation between the different flaps mentioned. And uh, the, so, more or less, the, the, all the authors are saying uh, more or less the same things. Huh? Uh, and uh, the uh, catalog, they, they sort of compared the triangular and the, the, env uh, the envelope or bayonet flapper. 
uh, and what they found that the, the, there was no significant difference in the plaque index behind the, 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 the second molar, the probing depth, trismus, edema, or the instance of uh, a dry socket, which is alveolar osteitis uh, between the, the two flaps. Uh. But what they noted is uh, the triangular flap uh, infers a number of advantages because remember, if you make a release, you increase your access. Uh, so the procedure becomes easier. Uh, uh, and uh, you, the visibility becomes easier. But however, the triangular flap was seen to be associated with more bleeding for obvious reasons because it's a wider exposure. And uh, Bakane et al, they concluded that the flap uh, to be used in young patients should be in according to, uh, to the surgeon's preference, uh, uh, taking the patient's needs and his oral hygiene into a, account. Uh, uh, so in conclusion, uh, as far as the flaps are concerned, uh, it can be inferred that even though there are a variety of flap designs to approach uh, wisdom teeth, the conclusion in the articles that we have studied are not very clear which is the better uh, type of flap. And uh, unfortunately, most studies have small sample sizes and, and uh, they do not take other possibly important variables into account. Uh, and after multiple attempt to carry out studies to compare different types of flaps with the reference to pain, inflammation, descent, maximum inter-incisal opening like trismus, periodontal health of the second molar, the truth is that most of the results uh, are not statistically significant. And moreover, in a few weeks or at most a few months, the results of the different types of flaps are equivalent. And many authors consider factors such as degree of the impaction of the third molar, the duration of the surgery, and the patient's toxic habits like smoking to be more important. Uh, we will move to cutting bone uh, and cutting or sectioning the tooth. And when we cut bone, what should we use to cut the bone? And when we cut the tooth, what is uh, the, the best instrument? I have seen some colleagues, they use uh, the high-speed uh, handpiece. Some would use the, so that's a type of the surgical uh, the surgical motor is what, what you are seeing down there, the implant motor. Uh, some they would use nowadays, there are some electric motors that are mounted in, in most chairs. Huh? Some would use chisel and hammer. And uh, more recently, some people are using piezo electric. Huh? So when, when we raise our flip, we, if, for example, if you are doing a horizontal, you want to make uh, what is called the Moore and Gibson collar technique. Huh? So you make a small collar of drilling bone around there before you, you divide the tooth in which, whichever direction you'd prefer to divide the tooth. Huh? Uh, so what, what we know is if you, if there is generation of heat is, we know that the normal body temperature is about uh, around 37 degrees Celsius. Huh? And as we increase the, the, the either atmospheric temperature or any temperature outside, uh, we know that there is a risk of, of burning or denaturation of cells. For example, in bone, we we'll end up denaturing uh, uh, or we end up with necrosis of the osteocytes, osteoblast, and osteoclaster. And uh, there are very many important things that we should consider uh, as parameters for our hand pieces and things like speed. Uh, how much speed should we use for our slow hand piece or our implant motor when we do third molar surgery? Uh, are we using very high speeds, low speed? Are we using air turbinate? I have asked that question already. And uh, when you drill, do you continuously drill 
because we know at 47 degrees Celsius for five minutes, we are already killing cells. Huh? And uh, how much pressure are you supposed to apply uh, using your handpiece? And uh, are we supposed to irrigate? So if you, our colleagues in orthopedic surgery, the colleagues that work with long bones, huh? they, they normally fascinate me because they, they drill bone without drilling, without irrigating most of the times. Huh? So if you are irrigating, what type of irrigant do you use? Are we using uh, tap water from Harare City Council, those in Harare, or uh, Dubai City Council, those in Dubai? Uh, and what is the temperature of the coolant? What are the different types of bears? Huh? So high speed versus slow speed electric for bone cutting. Huh? Uh, so there is a, a very huge study that was performed to assess uh, the outcomes. Huh? Uh, if we are using a, a slow speed huh? surgical handpiece, which is at 30,000 revolution per minute compared to a high, a high speed, huh? uh, which is 90,000 revolution per minute in the removal of third molars. Huh? So let me elaborate a, a bit further. So this comparison was for the same uh, machine, uh, this one. Huh? It's not comparing uh, our uh, high-speed uh, air turbinate end piece huh? uh, or air turbine. Huh? It's comparing uh, the implant motor, how much speed. Huh? So they looked at 100 patients and and those patients had bilateral impacted third molars. Huh? Uh, and uh, each patient served as his or her own control. So they were doing, so the experimental side was treated using 30,000 revolution per minute, uh, while the control side was treated using 90,000. So it was the same patient huh? left and right. And the drill speed used were alternated between the right and the left side of the patient to avoid bias introduced by the dominant hand of the dentist. And the patients were blinded to drill speed and were asked to complete a standardized pain and the swelling questionnaire for seven days immediately following the surgery. So the results were, were quite interesting. So the data was analyzed to determine the difference in pain, swelling, and complications in relationship to the drill speed used. And what they found that there was no statistically significant difference in the degree of pain, swelling, or any other complications when the speed was 30,000 versus when the speed was 90,000 revolution. So the study seemed to suggest that there is no difference in post-operative outcome when impacted third molars are removed, either when you are using a, a slower speed of your implant motor versus a higher speed of your uh, surgical motor. Uh, remember the surgical motor is the gold standard for third molar surgery where possible. Uh, you would want to avoid using your dental cutter. Uh, but however, if there is a dissertation that was done by a, a master student in, in Egypt where they, they looked at the electric motor uh, versus the, the, the high speeder. Uh, it was a very huge study. And uh, the electric motor was shown to cut uh, the tooth and even fillings more efficiently than the air turbine. So uh, what it means is uh, we, we should be moving towards integrating uh, our electric, electric motors into our dental cuts. Uh, because even for those of us who are doing crown preps, crown and bridge work, uh, it has now been concluded by several studies that using an electric motor. I hope we all know what an electric motor is. If we don't, maybe we can Google to research more. Uh, the electric motor 
is the way to go and is the trend. Uh, the temperature rise and the duration of temperature elevation uh, decreased with speed and force, suggesting that drilling at high speed and with large load is much more desirable than previously thought. So previously, people thought if you drill at high speeds, uh, you, you burn the bone. Uh, the some dentists or surgeons would use uh, the air uh, turbine handpiece and our high speed and the ones that we use for for which is driven by the compressor the the tricky thing about high speed and the high speed handpiece is is contraindicated to cutting bone anyway uh, because it burns the bone However, we still use the high speed to, we can use the high speed to section or divide the tooth, but there is a complication of a subcutaneous edema, or some people would call it soft tissue emphysema, which would present with a swelling. I have seen a few cases of that. So if you look at this is a CT scan, this dark area is in the cheek, it's all air. And the, the, so some people would call it subcutaneous tissue emphysema. It's a common disaster in third molar surgery. And we know that high-speed air turbine drills are used to section the tooth to facilitate extraction and are driven by compressed air at 3.5 to 4 kilograms force per square meter, which is rotating at, look at the speed, and for whatever reason, if you raise your right. mucoperiosteal flap and accidentally perforate the periosteum, so you should stay on bone. If you perforate the bone, as you drill with the high speed, the air now will escape or diffuse into the soft tissues. So it can find its way to the some many head and neck spaces, the masticator space, the pterygo, maxillary region, the lateral parapharyngeal space, or sometimes it, uh, the air can find its way to the mediastinum. And uh, the presence of pain both in the thorax and in the back would suggest that uh, the air has shifted to the chest. Uh, and you immediately have to do a chest X-ray. So this is a potentially catastrophic disaster uh, that's why uh, we should try to avoid using uh, our air turbine handpiece. Uh, there has been some case reports of air embolism, periorbital edema, facial space, uh, accumulation of air, or even blindness. Uh, uh, and similar reports for endo. Uh, look at all these publications. Uh, for subcutaneous uh, emphysema uh, during endodontic treatment, uh, where as you are drilling the tooth, uh, you, you end up now with air accumulating uh, uh, within the soft tissues. Uh, and the, the, we should try as much as possible to prevent this potentially uh, disastrous uh, uh, complication by uh, uh, most of the cases of, uh, we, we know that most of the cases of subcutaneous emphysema, uh, so as far as management is concerned, uh, most of the cases there's resolution in three to five days and complete resolution by a week without doing anything. Uh, but the patient must avoid increasing intraoral pressure by blowing the nose vigorously or playing music instruments, they can try to squeeze the air, antibiotic steroids, huh? and uh, we should raise a very clean mucoperiosteal flap and avoid uh, disrupting mus uh, muscle attachments. Huh? And uh, the when we do our retraction of the flap, we should ensure we protect uh, the flap, otherwise the drill can cut through the periosteum and uh, moreover, air turbine handpieces should not be used for longer than required. Uh, and some of them, they actually produce 
or release air from uh, from the head backwards, huh? and we should avoid using hydrogen peroxide uh, because it generates air bubbles, which can also exacerbate or worsen the subcutaneous tissue emphysema. And the the assistant should not be overzealous when they are retracting the flap; otherwise, they might perforate the periosteum. Huh? Uh, the the drive nowadays is to use a piezoelectric uh, and a piezoelectric that's the it's a new method of cutting bone uh, although it was first proposed in the 70s and by Wotton and it just it, it basically utilizes micro vibrations of scapulosa or it's like ultrasonic uh, and uh, the device is widely used uh, in cases in which bone is close to vital structures huh? like nerves, soft tissues. Huh? And uh, the good thing is uh, piezo, uh, it, it tends to avoid the risk of thermal and mechanical injury. So it has found its use in periodontal surgery, in craniofacial surgeries, in dental implantology, orthognathic, uh, or any other surgeries. Huh? And uh, the good thing is it, it does not, it's more friendly to bone, it doesn't cause osteonecrosis and, uh, and it sort of does not impair regeneration or healing of the, of the bone. Huh? So if, for example, if you are doing orthognathic surgery or cutting the mandible, it, or if you are doing a sinus lifter, when you cut the maxilla, the piezo will not cut the sinus membrane, imagine. And if you are cutting the mandible, it will not cut the inferior alveolar nerve. Uh, so the, 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 so the, the machine, it looks basically the same as our implant motor. Uh, it can actually, so it comes with a handpiece with different attachments or bears that you fit or mount uh, at the tips. Uh, I'm not advertising for any company, uh, but uh, uh, some of, so the, 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 the tips, or sometimes they are sores. Uh, it can also be used for, for scaling and polishing uh, for periodontal surgery, as, as, as I mentioned. Uh, and uh, there has been a scramble for uh, slowly, I think 15 years from now, we uh, would have moved from conventional rotary instruments because now even several meta analyses have been done uh, to look at the, the pain score. For example, there are four randomized control trials that have already been done. And they found that the pain score, if you do third molar surgery, uh, for the piezo electric group, uh, the pain is, was found to be significantly lower at uh, about a week post op conf uh, compared to conventional rotary instrument. Uh. And uh, uh, however, uh, there was no difference uh, uh, after uh, several days. Uh. Uh, and uh, the trismus was less for piezoelectric. Uh, the swelling was less for piezoelectric. And however, the disadvantage for piezoelectric is the operating time uh, is uh, much longer because it, it sort of cuts the bone much slowly. Uh, and the incidence of nerve damage in all these randomized control trial was found to be less with piezoelectrica. I will not talk so much about uh, uh, chisel and hammer. I know those of us who are working in remote areas uh, in the districts, sometimes we don't have the rotary instruments. Sometimes we don't have the piezoelectric machines. Uh, so we, will, we might be forced to use our chisel and hammer. But please bear in mind that there is always an increased risk of fractures and uh, most patients, they don't like chisel and hammer because I mean, the, the noise uh, 
And uh, uh, so it has been surpassed by rotary instruments, but uh, it's still an option. I think every dentist should have a chisel and a hammer. Once in a while you encounter those upper aids, particularly the upper aids that are very, very close to the seven and there is no spacer. And we really have no option but to, to use our chisel and, and hammer. And uh, when we irrigate, uh, uh, we, there is a study in which they looked at three different irrigants where people were used just water or distilled water, uh, normal saline and ring as lactator at, that, at a, rate of, a rate of 15 to 25 milliliters per minute. And uh, uh, the, the study uh, pointed out that saline was a very useful uh, coolant or irrigant for, for wisdom uh, or third molar surgery, but uh, uh, ringus lactate was superior uh, in improving the efficiency. It was a better lubricant uh, than normal saline. So what are we saying here? We are saying, uh, Whereas saline is cheaper uh, and very good, uh, but when it comes to rotation or lubrication, ringers lactate was found to be, to be better. So if you are doubting the efficiency or the power of your handpiece, then you would rather go for ringers lactate. Uh, and uh, a, a few, some few technical considerations for vertical a wisdom tita. So uh, you remember when we looked at assessing the degree of difficulty, uh, different scales that have been used, we, we know that the vertical, uh, the vertically impacted tooth is uh, one of the most difficult extraction. It, it usually looks innocent and uh, particularly if it is on the same occlusal or planar. Uh, so you sometimes you try to elevate it. Uh, so, uh, so what you are seeing here is an elevator which is broken between the seven and the eight. Uh, so the reason is the bone behind that. Uh, remember when we elevate the tooth, we are pushing it behind that. Uh, and sometimes if we continue to do that, we will end up causing a fracture of the mandibule. Uh, so the, the way to elevate usually is if there is sufficient space, you elevate between the seven and the eight and buccal. So the key word here is buccal elevation. So most of the times is you elevate buccal, and if you are fortunate, if the elevator goes to the facation region, uh, the tooth might come out. Huh? However, the disadvantage to that is you end up breaking the lingual cortex. Huh? For patients above 25 years, uh, sometimes even if you try to elevate mesial and back out, the tooth will not come out. Uh. So the solution is to divide the tooth. So if you look at the tooth, if you think the, the roots are hyperdivergent, uh, you section the tooth right through the facation area. So a common disaster is as you section the tooth you get a bed splitter. So instead of going right in between, you find yourself, because sometimes you lose orientation of where you are going, or sometimes our hand pieces, because they are, they are not as contra-angled as we would want. So actually there are special hand pieces that we might use, like what they call the 45 degree angulated, hand pizza, but in the absence of that, the way to go is to divide the tooth into two. What happens if the root is conical? If the root is conical, you still have to divide the tooth into two. And dividing the tooth not only makes the procedure easy, but it also, it's also a way of protecting the nerve, especially in cases where the nerve is going through the interradicular bone. Um, 
However, sometimes if the roots are not high but divergent, uh, another technique is to cut uh, this part of the crown. Huh? So if you cut down as you are reaching the vacation area, you, you go horizontal. So once if you do that, if you put an elevator and move the tooth distally, you will notice that uh, the obstruction was coming from the distal end of the tooth hitting the bone. So as you elevate the tooth distally, once if you have taken off the distal cusp, uh, you notice that sometimes the tooth will rotate, particularly for younger patients with softer bone. Uh, but again, this does not always work and sometimes you are forced to go deeper uh, into the vacation uh, region. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, so this is a patient that we saw we had a, a tooth in the TMJ. So if you a closer look, this is the external auditory meters, the ear, and this is the condyle, and this is the coronoid processor. And uh, what we are seeing is a tooth in the, in the condyle, uh, or into the ramasa. So if you do it again, if you do an intraoral periapical, uh, as we mentioned, you, you will probably not see the tooth. Uh, and you, you, you end up just prescribing antibiotics. So if you look, there is a fistula tract uh, draining into the oral cavity. And this is as a result of the, remember the, the, the tooth develops a, uh, from as a diverticulum or diversion from the oral epithelium. Uh, so it remains attached to the oral epithelium by the gubernaculum code. Uh, so let me take you back to embryology. So you end up with uh, the part of the dental follicle, uh, which is from the reduced enamel epithelium, uh, who, who is what forms the fistula that drains behind there. Uh, so in such a case, you have to do an extra oral approach. Uh, so you actually open from outside, lift the masseter, this is the tooth, and then you do the disimpaction uh, from outsider. So after we we'll take a, a, a three to five minutes break after we have covered maxillary, uh, the, the next disaster, which is breaking the maxillary tuberosidan. So at 6 p.m., we'll take a five minutes break and then we'll take a few questions as directed by Dr. Vicky. However, the, 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 the another common disaster is a fracture of the maxillary tuberosita. So you, you, you realize that the maxilla is softer compared to the mandibule. It's more of cancellous bone whereas the, the mandible is more of cortical bone, which is why when we do many procedures, for example, in the maxilla, the amount of force that we should apply if you are doing third molars should be minimal. Otherwise you end up with the maxilla in your hand if you are not careful. A very common disaster, but not in third molar surgery is uh, for example, if you are doing uh, orthognathic surgery uh, uh, for a patient with a, a, a class three uh, mouth occlusion, remember we do a level one osteotomy and advance the maxilla. So sometimes you will advance using a wire or if you are not careful, you can pull the maxilla and then the maxilla is out. Uh, so we should be careful instead of celebrating that the tooth is out, as I said, you might be saying maxilla out. And uh, uh, this is not an uncommon complication, the fracture of the maxillary tuberosita. There is a study that was done for 323 uh, patients uh, for, for upper wisdom teeth and they found that the fracture of, of, of the maxillary tuberosity was the commonest complication 
up to 2% of the, of the patient. And the, the maxillary, there's even another study with out of 252 cases, 28 cases had uh, different degrees of uh, maxillary tuberosity fractures. Huh? Uh, some were slight, some were moderate, and some were classified as severe. Uh, so, so these patients sometimes, instead of, so we say it's severe if uh, the fracture not only involves the maxillary tuberosity, but even the pterygoid plates. And now the thing about pterygoid plates is that's where your there are some important muscles that attach there, uh, muscles like your pterygoid muscles, the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. Huh? And your patient, who, and those muscles are important for mouth opening. So most of the patients with maxillary tuberosity fractures, huh? they will present with trismus. Huh? Uh, so so in, 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 in his book, a book called Dental Extraction, Coleman cited Catlin's uh, work dating uh, as far back as 1858, where a case of maxillary tuberosity fracture was reported, resulting in deafness due to disruption of the pterygoid hamulus and uh, the tensor muscle. And this in turn damaged the station, the station tube or the tympanic tube. As a result, the patient was left with also not only deafness, but permanent trismus due to damage to the pterygoid muscle and ligaments. So there are about three muscles that are attached to the lateral pterygoid plates. So you, as I mentioned, I'm just repeating, the medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid muscle, which is important. These are important muscles of mastication and your, your tensor veli palatin, which is a muscle that is attached to the eustachian or tympanic tube. The tympanic tube is a tube which connects the oropharynx to the middle ear, whose function is to equilibrate air between the middle ear and the oral cavity huh? to equilibrate the atmospheric pressures, huh? uh, which is why if you go in low pressure zones or uh, maybe in descent of like uh, when flies are descending, you feel like the your, your, your ears are, or your tympanic membrane is about to rupture or to blow out. Huh? It's because of changes in atmospheric, sudden changes in atmospheric pressure. Now, if the muscles that are attached that control the mechanism uh, of opening the tympanic tube, if they are damaged, then you might end up with deafness. And the, what is the fuss about this tuberosit? Is it important? Why not just break it? Huh? It's important. The prosto guys, uh, Dr. Tarvinga et al., they would say, they would require it for, 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 for dentures. Huh? And in forensic medicine, uh, in, when we assess degree of injury, if someone's tuberosity breaks, sometimes we score up to 30% disability. So imagine if someone loses the eye, the score is around 20 to 30%. If you break the tuberosity, because it's thought that the amount of force that is required to break the tuberosity is very high. So imagine if you, for litigations, if our patients would take us to court, then they, they are going to be scored 30%, and that is a very high disability. And nowadays, for patients where there is the pneumatization of the sinuses, uh, and very thin bone, you can, you would want to put your, your implants in the tuberosity. So you want to preserve the maxillary tuberosity. And which patients usually end up with fracture of the maxillary tuberosity? And what are the risk factors? Usually, the way we apply our elevators, if we are too rough or a lot of force 
or inadequate force, you break the tuberosita. And uh, this is a very important category, isolated upper molars. Huh? So usually what happens is if you, for whatever reason, if the upper six is extracted early in life, huh? uh, you remember the volume of alveolar bone, part of the function or the role of teeth is to maintain uh, alveolar bone quantity. Huh? And if you lose, then there is a pneumatization or thinning of the bone. And you, it's thought that uh, when you extract a tooth, you lose 40% of the alveolar or bone height. Huh? Now, when you do an extraction in such patients, they are at a higher risk. So of, of breaking the tuberosity, they are at a higher risk also of oral antral communication. Huh? So large maxillary, uh, Patients also with the large pneumatized sinus higher risk, patients with periapical infection, cyst tumors, uh, patients with the history of mid face trauma, like our LEFO one fracture, it sort of weakens the pterygoid plates and the maxilla. Uh, patients with, uh, more importantly, the tooth morphology is, is a very important factor where patients with divergent roots, curved roots, very long roots into the sinus, patients with the germination where the eight and the seven are stuck together or with concrete sense or hypersementosis, eh, those should raise an alarm of uh, the possibility of a maxillary tuberosity fracture. And Cohen reported a case of a tuberosity fracture that occurred uh, for a patient who had five uh, roots. So even multiple roots on one tooth, it also should uh, raise an alarm. And this conclusion is the degree of impaction and root morphology are the most important risk factors. Huh? And the tuberosity morphology uh, is no association. So don't look at the X-ray to look at the shape of the tuberosity and you, you want to use it as a predictor. Uh, of uh, the risk of, uh, of tuberosity fracture. And uh, the panorex also is, it's, uh, and when you evaluate the risk, the better option is to use a CBCT uh, because uh, if the panorex, uh, it, uh, it exaggerates the, the picture by uh, close to 2.1 times compared to a CBCT. So if you look at these roots, you would think they are in the sinus, but remember uh, the, 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 the shenadarian membrane or the membrane of the maxillary sinus is sometimes it's scalloping uh, around the roots. Uh, so it might create an illusion of the roots are in the sinus and the sinus is a three dimensional uh, image. Uh, so, and uh, so how do we manage these patients? Uh? So the focus should be on avoiding the complication. And uh, of course the management depends on the age, the general health of the patient, uh, and whether the sinus, whether there's an oral antral communication, it also depends on the overall condition of the alveolar process, the degree of the fracture and the presence of antagonist. So, how do we prevent uh, this risk? We prevent it. Sometimes you, 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 you have to divide the tooth huh? because what, what, what we now know is the more you divide the tooth, the less force is required to extract the tooth. Huh? Uh, and then you, there is a certain maneuver where you put your finger behind the alveolar bone during the extraction, like what is happening there. So one finger, the index finger is distal as you are elevating the, the tooth. Huh? So it sort of gives you a guideline of whether the tuberosity is moving. Huh? Uh, and then if you lose your first or second molar, try to replace them immediately because you never know later in life, uh, you might end up with loss of bone pneumatization of sinuses and loss of Ma uh, and the fracture of the maxillary tuberosity. And you should 
most of the times when the tuberosit breaks the palatal mucosa, it's torn and also they can be injury of the greater palatine vessels and nerves. Huh? And that will result in, in a big disaster of bleeding. And so actually the greater palatine, it's nicknamed the anaconda in third molar surgery. And uh, so then what you do, once if you notice that uh, the tuberosit is broken, uh, uh, there are a number of options. Uh, you could defer or abort the procedure uh, and then just uh, re-suture the tooth back into position. Uh, and then you come back maybe two, three months later uh, and then you use a different technique. Or if the fracture is severe, sometimes you have to fix the fracture or do an open reduction in internal fixation. However, in cases of infections, or if you were, the indication for the extraction was it, the, it was symptomatic, then you cannot abort the procedure because if you abort the procedure, the, the infection will worsen and the patient will still be in the very same pain that they presented with. And uh, if the bone is small, you can just discard it together with the tooth, like what you are seeing here. If it is big, that's when you, you, you fix it back into place. Huh? And uh, as I said, avoid excessive force. You section the tooth. Uh, more importantly, this is thought to be the most important maneuver where you, you, you put your periosteal elevator. So when you do your upper eta, you take your periosteal elevator, you sink it into the PDL space, right round or posterior to try to widen that space. So it sort of separates your upper wisdom tooth from, uh, from the maxillary tuberosita. Uh, and then you become as gentle as is possible. Um, so at, at this stage, we'll, I will hand over to Dr. Vicky uh, before we continue uh, for the remaining, uh, we'll do another 45 minutes and then we'll be done. Dr. Vicky, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Um, are there any questions, members? So thank you for the first part of um, the lecture. I didn't know there were quite so many risks to doing wisdom tooth extractions. Um, I guess you might be getting more referrals. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes. <laughs> um, any questions from members before we proceed? So there's a comment in the chat box from Dr. Moyana. He's just saying thank you for the evidence-based foundation you used to either support or dispute an argument. So I mean, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Ma Moyana, for that comment. Thank you, anyone, Dr. Moyana. Yes. If anyone has a question, you can just unmute yourself and go ahead. It seems there are no questions yet, Doc. Yes, I don't know whether we should do take a, a short break or we should continue. What do you suggest? Um, I don't know if we should take a short break or just continue. Anyone? Dr. Chungwena, what do you think? Should break for the speakers to drink some water. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay, it's fine. It's seven past. Can we say we come uh, resume at 10 past? Someone said a smoking break. Yeah, okay, all sorts of breaks. <laughs> <laughs> we can right. resume in three minutes, is that okay? All right, That's thank 10. you. All right. So we'll, we'll continue with some of the, the, the disasters, 101 disasters in third molar surgery. So fracture mandibular. So iatrogenic fractures of the mandibule, the, the incidence is very, very low. But whereas it's low to that one particular patient, it's, it's very devastating. It's no longer about numbers to the patient affected. 
but it's 100% to that particular patient who is affected. And it's thought that the wisdom to the fact that it occupies some space within the mandible, it creates a potential a weakness. In fact, we also know that fractures of the angle mandible for other reasons, road traffic accidents are more common compared to many sites. And one of the hypotheses is the issue of the impacted wisdom tooth, which creates a, a potential weak point. And uh, so most of the fractures for, for, for mandible, they okay during the procedure or later in time. And uh, uh, so this is a very good example. So this is a, a, a CBCT, uh, 3D uh, with a wider field of viewer. Uh, demonstrating a horizontally impacted tooth which was being extracted and the procedure had to be aborted because uh, of the fracture there. And uh, so, but what, what we know is uh, most of these fractures, uh, uh, they don't occur during the procedure. So this is very interesting. Huh? Uh, in fact, the ratio of fractures that are, if that okay, during versus after, the ratio is 2.7 to one. And, uh, and most of them would okay in the second and third week in 57% of the cases. So the patient, who, typically the patient will tell you that they had a cracking noise in 70%, 77% of the cases. But the intraoperative fractures, in some study, they were found to be more frequent in, in, in females uh, uh, compared to uh, the male counterpart. Uh, whereas the post-operative fractures were found to be more common in males. And uh, there's a publication in, in 2000 where they were doing a series of mandibular fractures after third molar surgery. It was done by Crimeo et al. And what they found that is the, that the major risk factor for, for this complication seemed to be a advanced patient age. The degree of impaction is, is, is also something to consider if you want to see who is at risk. And also any pre-existing pathologies, obviously, if there is an ameloblastoma, osteomyelitis, whatever is happening there. And uh, an analysis of 130 cases of mandibular fractures after third molar surgery, uh, they realized that these were the risk factors, age, gender, uh, angulation, laterality. Wow. Uh, so basically what it means is the, most of these fractures, they were found to okay on the left, side uh, compared to the right side, even the images that I have shown you. Uh, and it's partly because uh, most uh, right. dentists are right dominant right. and uh, they are more likely to have uncontrolled force from if they move or shift to, to the left side. Uh, uh, so these are the other risk factors mentioned, uh, pathologies, excessive cutting of bone, the excessive force and uh, the the issue of gender being a risk factor uh, they are con conflicting uh, reports uh, so they, 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 there is no conclusion but it's thought that uh, the reason why men uh, so what they found is that men for men the fractures were more often post-operative, whereas for women, they were intra-operative. It's because of the greater biting force for men, the amount of force generated in mastication after. And for women, it's also because of limited mouth opening during the procedure. The average mouth opening for females is between 40 millimeter to 50 millimeter, whereas for, for men, it's between 45 millimeter to 55, huh? so limited access 
you end up using more force to try to get a tooth out huh, because of a poor visibility and also issues to do with bone density. And uh, let me not get too academic. Uh, I know Dr. Simangolo will not be very happy. So I will just mention that uh, uh, age is a risk factor. Uh, as we increase in age, there is decrease in bone elasticity and uh, the occurrence of osteoporosis in elderly patients uh, is a possible explanation. And in the same vein, uh, the issues of ankylosis, uh, uh, all those issues that come with age uh, are very key. And uh, a study by Wagner et al, uh, they found that the fractures were more on the left side for reasons that I explained and uh, the right dominant surgery. And uh, Although Crimeo reported uh, two cases of bilateral mandibular fractures, uh, and those were as a result of RTA and sports, respectively. So this is someone who they have done third molar surgery, and then they, they get involved in a road traffic accident. Uh, so uh, they realized that the risk factor for getting those fractures for these two patients was the third molar surgery. Uh, and uh, the depth of impact, impaction is also important uh, because the deeper the tooth, it means you are more likely to drill deeper and you lose more bone. And as you elevate uh, the, the tooth, will, I mean, the bone or the mandible will break. And the management is you, you, you want to, to avoid the fracture happening by, by modifying all the risk factors. Uh, that's why we, we spend more time on the trying to elaborate the risk factors. Huh? And uh, so patients at risk should be thoroughly uh, briefed on the importance of uh, a proper post-operative diet. Huh? You remember, most of the fractures are occurring after, so they need to be on soft diet. Uh, the good thing is most of these fractures are either green stick or hairline fractures. It means in other ways, there is no displacement and uh, the management, you can just do a, a maxillomandibular fixation or some people would call it an IMF uh, or in patients who are in advanced age uh, where you are worried about non-union or if someone presents with an, with an infection, then ORIF would be the way to go. Uh, sometimes, uh, we can accidentally push the root or the or a whole tooth into the maxillary sinus. So this is a very common uh, complication. In fact, the tooth or the root in this uh, in the sinus, uh, there is a, a case series of 150 cases, and uh, where they found that it's usually the maxillary molars and premolars. Uh, uh, that's where they, what they found. Uh, those are particularly the, the, the root of the first molar. Why the first molar uh, is uh, more prone to, uh, to moving either the root or the whole tooth into the sinus uh, is because it's the most often extracted because of carious decay as it is the first tooth to erupt. Uh, and by the time it erupts at the age of seven uh, and most uh, uh, children at that time are not conscious in terms of their dental hygiene, so they end up with cavities. Huh? And they also found out that the palatal root was the most affected huh, in 26% of the cases. Huh? And why palatal, why not distal buccal or MB roots? Huh? Uh, the, it's also because of the degree of divergence uh, with other roots, and uh, it means it's most likely going to fracture. And uh, uh, most of the cases were, uh, were on the left side uh, for, for the reasons that I explained for fractures. Uh. And these patients with the roots in the sinuses, uh, the presentation is sometimes you just observe that there's something, you hear a very interesting sound. And those of you, I'm sure those of us who have practiced uh, long enough 
might have seen the characteristic uh, sound of like a stone being dropped into a cup with fluid, huh? like, uh, but you can also do a Fasalva maneuver where you ask the patient to hold their nose, uh, close their nose and ask them to, to blow and you see some, uh, some bubbling effect. You see some fluid or droplets leaking. Huh? Yeah, but the better diagnosis can be done by a CPCT, corn beam CT, or if you irrigate into the socket and you will see that there is bubbling effect because of breathing. Now air is getting into the nose, into the sinus, and into, into the, the oral antral communication. Huh? Yeah. But what is interesting is most of the patients, 86%, uh, usually by the time they present, it's symptomatic. And some of them are asymptomatic. There is no pain, no nothing. Uh, some have sinusitis. Most cases eventually develop complication, complications over time. Uh, that's why we need to come in. And some of the complications are devastating. Uh, you remember the veins in the mid facer, particularly what is called the danger triangle of the facer. So the danger triangle is a triangle that is formed by an imaginary line drawn from the glabella or the nasal bridge to the two commissions angle of the mouth. So the veins, they do not have valves. So the fact that the veins don't have valves, it means infections can move either down or up. So if they move up, they will end up in the inferior ophthalmic or superior ophthalmic veins, which connects with the cavernous, venous uh, sinus in the brain. And you can get a cavernous venous sinus thrombosis, which is an emergence and the mortality rate is close to 100%. You can get, so if you come to Paris, you'll see patients like this once in a while. Uh, so they will end up in the hands of neurosurgeons and uh, the dentist is called in to co-manage uh, the, the patient with our ophthalmology and the neurosurgery colleagues. Huh? Facial pain, all these meningitis. Uh, so as I say, the diagnosis is either clinical or you have to do imaging. Huh? So if you do imaging, most of the times the, the root is in a low position, huh? uh, which is 60%. But sometimes it's high, high, like close to the orbit, or sometimes it's stuck on the what is called the, the meatus of the maxillary sinus, which is the point where the maxillary sinus drains into the nose. So in a few cases, it's stuck there. If it is small, it will find its way into the nose and the patient will swallow it. And that is good news. Uh, so sometimes you ask the patient to shake their head. Huh? So if the patient shakes their head, they will actually hear a sound huh, of an object. Remember the sinus is an empty cavity, an empty space. Huh? So they actually hear a co -co 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 sound. Huh? So if they move to the left, to the right. Huh? Therefore, uh, uh, it is very necessary to, to perform a 3D X-ray huh, in the form of a CPCT. Huh? before extraction, because if you go in uh, blindly, you will not be able to find the way the root is up because it's mobile. Huh? It might be stuck in the middle meters and you, you, you will be stuck there. Uh, so this is a very good example of a root that was moved uh, and it's in the low close to the alve alveolar bone. And this is on the middle meter stuck somewhere there. Uh, so the management, uh, some people have said if it is small, you can just follow up the patient and they have reported good results. Huh? But by and large, the gold standard is to, you have to retrieve the root because it's a foreign body and you can retrieve it by, you have to open the sinus. Huh? So you can open around the alveolar crest, which is the AEA approach, or you can open what is called the cow door look approach, uh, which is actually the commonest, uh, this tour. 
uh, or you can do a lateral approach. You can do endoscopic, like using cameras uh, through the nose into the middle meters, uh, or you can do a combination of all these. Uh, uh, but please note that in 2% of the cases, the root is spontaneously swallowed. Uh, so it moves into the sinus, into the nose, and then it's swallowed. Uh, typically, if it is a small root tipper, but the stakes are very high for, for us to just leave it there. Uh, and the, 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 so the different procedures have been performed. Uh, so in the early 50s, uh, the gold standard, the blue line is, is uh, the alveolar crest approach. Uh, like in around 1976, almost everyone was having that, that approach. But remember, during that time, there was no CBCT yeah, to really localize, yeah? and it's very difficult. So that approach, you are you are opening just above the uh, just above the the uh, the, the tooth uh, that has migrated into the sinus. Yeah? Uh, it doesn't give a very good view. That's that's why progressively called a look CA, which is the red line, is now the preferred uh, approach. Let me not get so much into that. So the cow look remains the gold standard, although it has limitations of causing facial pain, sometimes uh, uh, paresthesia because of the infraorbital nerve if the surgeon or the dentist is not careful in dissecting that area. Uh, or uh, they might be damaged to the anterior superior of viola nerve. Uh, so the cow do look, for example, if this tooth uh, during extraction of the upper aida, uh, there was a disaster of the tooth uh, moving into the sinus. Uh, and uh, uh, so you, the cow do look, you make an incision on the gingiva on top. So you try to, to leave a five millimeter cuff on an attached gingiva so that the suturing is easy. And then you see bone, you drill a big, which I mean a big ostium or, or which corresponds to the size of the tooth that you want to, to pull out. If there is an infection, you leave a drainage tube for irrigation. Uh, but uh, if there is no infection, you open a window, you perforate. Uh, so this is a, a, a tooth in the sinus. You perforate the membrane of the sinus. Uh, and then you use a mosquito or artery forcep to retrieve uh, the, the router. Uh, so another complication, which is almost similar to routine the sinus is oral antral communication. And it occurs particularly for patients with long roots or impacted upper, upper AIDS. Huh? And the, the causes are uh, extraction of upper molars. Huh? Uh, patients with tuberosid fractures, huh? patients with the periapical infections, or our dental implants might get dislodged into the maxillary sinus. So the sinus is, so this is a CT scan or CBCT. Uh, this is our maxillary sinus. Huh? So the one on the left is opacified. Huh? So uh, under normal circumstances, you should be seeing air in the maxillary sinus and air in the ethmoid sinus. Huh? So this is the, the orbit, uh, the, the ethmoid is medial to the, uh, to the, the ethmoid sinus is medial to, to the orbit uh, or the eye socket. So the infection, remember all these sinuses are connected together. So sometimes you end up with a pan-sinusitis, uh, uh, which is an infection involving the maxillary sinus ethmoid, sphenoid, and frontal sinus. So up here is actually the frontal sinus. Uh, other causes are trauma, uh, cyst tumors, osteoradionecrosis. Uh, if you do, if you are doing other flaps for oral nasal procedures, uh, uh, all these things can cause. Uh, uh, and the diagnosis is almost the same as routine the sinus. So you, the, how do you tell whether your patient is in oral antral communication? So this is a very devastating also, it's also devastating to the, to the patient, this complication. Huh? 
And uh, uh, so there is nasal regurgitation of liquids, uh, altered nasal resonance, difficulty in sucking through a straw, unilateral nasal discharge, bed test, infections, pain. Uh, sometimes there is a, an antral polyban, which you see intraoral, it's like a growth granulation tissue coming from there. Uh, some patients are asymptomatic. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the diagnosis of for small defects, uh, uh, a nose blowing test is not a very good idea. Uh, because you, you sort of increase the, the, the size of the OR or of the communication. Huh? And you should avoid putting a probe there or a fasalva maneuver eh, or, or these cheap blowing maneuvers. Huh? Eh, so what, what, what we, we now know is eh, most of the times an oral antral communication, there's a difference between oral antral communication and oral antral fistula. Uh, so oral immediately when there is a communication, it's called just an oral antral communication, which is OAC. Yeah? But when there is the epitheralization of, uh, which usually can okay on day three, yeah? then it's no longer an oral antral communication, it's now a fistula. And uh, some people think that the fistula occurs after seven days. Huh? So this fistula, you can either find it uh, on the, within the socket, uh, what is called an alveolar sin uh, sinus communication, or on the palatal side or on the vestibular side, depending on the etiology. And uh, so untreated larger defects can lead to infections. And typically 50% of patients with oral antral communication within two days, huh, they already have a active infection. And we know 90% of them who have infections in two weeks huh, uh, because of food and saliva contamination. Huh? Uh, and Wasmud reported development of sinusitis in 60% of cases by fourth day. Huh? Uh, so why am I emphasizing on the issue of infections by the third day? Uh, it's because we, we, we would then need to intervene early enough to avoid infections. Huh? And so a, a confirmatory test is, is very important. Uh, if you are doing upper impacted wisdom teeth, you should always try to evaluate for oral antral communication. And the closure is Preferably, it should be done within 24 hours. You increase your, you minimize your risk of ending up with an infection. And it's also important to do a CBCT, as I said. So this is a war or an oral antral communication. It sort of gives you a guideline of the size because sometimes the, the management protocol depends on the, on the size. But when, when you want to close the oral antral, be it communication or fistula, it's, it's important to do a pre-operative irrigation with normal saline followed by iodine mixed at a ratio of one S to one with normal saline. So you, you keep on lavaging or washing the sinus until uh, the retain or the color uh, is more clear. And the success rate uh, for immediate closure of oral antral communication is very high. It's 95%, but a very big but. Uh, you need to do it properly uh, so that you, we don't end up with a dehiscence. In other words, you close and then it opens up. Uh, so because now with secondary closures, uh, uh, the success rate declines to uh, now one out of three patients that would have undergone secondary closure, so we end up with an opening. And the principle is uh, the sinus must be clean or devoid of infection. So prescribe your antibiotics, do your, your lavage, clean the sinus, unless if it is, if you notice it immediately and repair immediately, probably there is no need to do a rinsing uh, of the sinus. Uh. And also, if you, uh, 
Please note that rinsing the sinus, that fluid that you rinse into the sinus, some of it will come back through the dental socket. Some of it will get into the nose. And the patient, it's very uncomfortable, but you should reassure the patient that they might choke. And when they choke, they should just cough so that they don't aspirate, or they should just swallow the fluid. And a successful closure of oral antral fistula should be preceded by complete elimination of any sinus pathology. If, they, if it is a fistula, you should cut or scrape off the epithelium. Uh, so the, the algorithm is, uh, if there is, you look at it, is there is sinusitis, if the answer is yes, you need to check whether it's acute or chronic. If it is acute, as I said, you do medications and irrigate. If it is chronic, then you, you have to open that sinus and debride it. Huh? So you can debride it either by a code or look procedure. You open the sinus and then sometimes you strip off all the mucosa in the sinus huh? and then you allow it to regenerate or you can do it endoscopically, what is called functional endoscopic sinus surgery. And if there is no infection, and if the size of the fistula is less than five millimeter, you then expect spontaneous healing. If, the, if it is more than five millimeter, then you, you have to, to intervene surgically either by using flaps. There are so many surgical. In fact, let me confuse it. Let me bring in a very crowded slide here. So all these are surgical protocols uh, for managing an oral antral fistula. So they range from autogenous techniques where you're you just uh, using the same tissue from the same patient uh, or allogenous where you're using tissue from human beings uh, that has been deactivated either by radiation or what is called lyophilization, or you can do from animals and xenografts, and like the porcine things, and, and the synthetic materials, and can also be used and others. And, but by and large, most of the times we are using soft tissue flaps, which can either be local or distant. So the distance is the tongue flaps. You can craft some cartilage because some of the fistulas are very notorious and you might even need to take the whole temporalis muscle and put it into the socket, huh? particularly for patients with prior history of radiation and there is, or there is a huge disease there, uh, or previous history of cleft lip palate, huh? those things. Huh? Uh, so, but the basic maneuver that we can do in our offices is, is a very old technique described by Raman in 1936, huh? whereby uh, you, you, you raise a buckle, so it's, it's, it's a buckle advancement flipper. So you, you first clean the socket. Uh, so the flip is designed in such a way that it has a broad base and a narrow end uh, so that you preserve blood supply. And then you elevate the flip right onto the bone. So this is a, a, a coronal view we are looking from from the top eh? and then you elevate the flap. So the communication is here. So you can do also what is called an intra-alveolar uh, intra -alveolar plast where you break the interradicular bone and you flip it to that side eh? uh, before you do, you advance the flap. So the flap should be pulled to, to the palatal side. Eh? Now, uh, most of the times it does not reach the palatal side. Uh, so the simple maneuver is uh, the description by Raman, he said you should score or cut the periosteum in a horizontal fashion. So once if you cut the periosteum, the tenting effect uh, reduces and you immediately gain uh, up to four to five millimeter increase in the length of this flavor, but you should not be aggressive. So in fact, as you cut with your scapel, you should bevel uh, 
your blade in the long longitudinal axis of the flapper. Otherwise, if you do it in a horizontal axis, you button or the flap or you end up holding the flap in your hands. Huh? And then you, you, now you don't know what to do with that piece of gum tissue within your hands. Huh? Um, so uh, the, the problem with the Raman flap, whereas it's very easy and it's the, it's the commonest, when you pull it to that side, huh? Uh, they, you end up shallowing the, the vestibular depth. And for patients who might need dentures in future, then you might need to come back to do a vestibuloplasty, or you might be forced then to, to, to do an implant supported danger. And uh, so the modification was uh, there's a modification by MOXA, which is called Bacow sliding flapper. So you, you, you make the same incision like Raman. But you 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 then extend it like several teeth in front or behind, so that is a huge flapper, and then you still score the periosteum in a horizontal fashion up up there, and then you slide it. Huh? So this one, because the movement or the vector for the flap is anterior posterior, you will preserve the depth of this of the festival or the sulcus, which is very good for, for in, in future if you want to do any removable prosthetic work. However, uh, the disadvantage is you are moving papillae of teeth uh, and you end up with sometimes gingival recession and uh, an aesthetic result. Uh, and uh, other techniques are the palatal flapper. So when all oh, these, when the Raman or back of left fails and the patient comes back, the suggestion is to cut onto the palate. So there's an anaconda here, which is the greater palatine vessel coming from the greater palatine foramen. So you cut it in that's, that fashion. So once if you cut it, you, you please don't forget to clean the, the, the socket. Uh, so this diagram, uh, uh, there are so many images. Huh? So you cut it, you lift it huh? right onto the bone, then, uh, and you, 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 you then lift that mucosa here so that you can slide it below. Uh, so uh, you slide it below that small island of mucosa, and then you suture it there. And then you leave this portion to granulator. Uh, so there are several modifications that you can do depending on your mood uh, during that time. One is to de-epithelialize to remove a small portion because you don't want the mucosa of this flap to be below this mucosa. So you want to remove the mucosa so that the portion below this strip yeah, I hope we can visualize what's going on here. It does not have any mucosa or skin. Okay. Um, so the so the post-op outcome will be will be like that. However, the other modification is you you can do a sub-epithelial connective tissue flavor. So you, you do you draw an H here. And then you, you lift the mucosa and you, you are not on the periosteum and then you lift one flap anterior and another one posterior. And then you go deeper and take the connective tissue below and then you slide the connective tissue into the socket. And then you bring back the mucosa back there so that you don't leave bone exposed. Uh, the other reliable thing to do, uh, and this is my, my preferred way to close all my oral antral communication cases is, is a, a, a double sandwich approach where I combine uh, the, the buckle fat pedal. So you, you, you raise your flap uh, if you are doing the wisdom tooth, uh, and then you perforate the periosteum and then you drive your mosquito, you see an, an egg yolk colored uh, fat coming from there. So that is the back of fat pedal. And then you suture it to the 
palatal mucosa. And then after that, you still pull the oral mucosa to close the oral antral uh, communication. Huh? Uh, but there are so many other techniques, as I said, you can do bone grafts. Uh, you can do an interceptor of yellow plast. You can graft a cartilage. Uh, this is a very interesting one by Yoshimasha in Japan, where they were, whenever they removed, if you are doing oral antral for a sixer, you would then transplant the third molar uh, into the socket. Uh, I think in part three of disasters, we'll look at uh, wisdom teeth transplantation, uh, a case series of some of the cases that we have done and uh, how it can be used to close oral antral communication. Uh, uh, all these guided tissue regeneration, uh, all these things can be used. Uh, the list is very long. Uh, uh, even for big fistulas, you can even borrow from the from the tongue. Huh? So you cut on the dorsal surface of the tongue, and then you you don't disconnect it from the tongue, and then you suture it there. Then once if you suture, you leave it for three weeks whilst the patient is on liquid diet. Then after three weeks, it would have taken the tongue flap would have. To, then you disconnect and return it back to the tongue. The disadvantage is it will look like this. So we normally would use this for, for other causes of oral nasal or oral antral communication. And then you, you, you need to depopulate it. Otherwise, uh, the, there will be a lot of uh, gustatory or, or test uh, on the, on the palate. Uh, and the post-op for patients for oral antral communication, they are on soft diet, chewing with the other side, avoid strenuous activities, nose blowing and should be avoided for two weeks. Huh? And the coughing, sneezing, all those things are not good. They should not put their finger or tongue there on the sutures. The wound should be kept clean with normal saline, avoid the use of straws, smoking. They can use steam inhalation. Uh, they can be on antibiotics, nasal decongestants, uh, like otrifin, uh, so that they shrink the mucosa and keep the antral open, the uh, opening patent, and then NSAIDs, non steroidal anti inflammatories. Huh? Sometimes uh, the tooth is in the cheek, uh, it can be the upper wisdom tooth. Uh, this is another case where the tooth was in the chica. Uh, so the last part of our discussion is. Uh, uh, damage to the inferior alveolar nerve. And uh, this is, uh, uh, so injured to the inferior alveolar nerve during third molar surgery. Uh, this is the most devastating. Huh? So if we rank uh, the disasters from wisdom teeth, uh, the ones that patients do not like, uh, I would put this number one. Huh? And the incidence is very variable. Uh, some authors have reported an incidence of up to uh, uh, up to ten percent actually, uh, with permanent uh, in injury up to three point six percent. And uh, we, we need to now the fact that this is devastating. We need to to be able to predict which patients who end up with with damage to the inferior alveolar nerve. Uh, Rude and the uh, Noraudin Shabab in 1990, they came up with seven radiographic indicators uh, of, uh, of the possibility of damage to the inferior of Yola Neva. So four of their signs were observed on the tooth root on an X-ray and the other three in the canal. So, so there was the issue of darkening of the periapical region, deflection or narrowing, of the root and the bifid root apex. Huh? And the, for the canal, if there is diversion, narrowing and interruption of the tram lines or the white lines. So what do we mean? Uh, so number one is if there is darkening of what you are seeing, darkening of the root in the periapical region, if there is deflection, it means the nerve is is near. If there is narrowing of the root, as what you are seeing, the nerve is closer. 
if there is bifid uh, root apex, huh? uh, if there is interruption, so the, the inferior of your canal, you will see two lines normally, but if you see one line, it means the tooth is in the canal. And if there is diversion, so the canal suddenly deflects or changes direction or suddenly narrows. Huh? So if you look on the X-ray, uh, this is what you would see, huh? darkening around the periapical region, narrowing of, of the root, as you can see, uh, changing. So we, we so deflection of the root tips huh, is what you are seeing there. And then if you look at the course of the inferior violar nerve here, it's changing direction. Uh, so all these are predictors of, of nerve damage. So if you see those on an X-ray, uh, be careful. And but uh, the thing about uh, most of these 2D images, they are false. In fact, on CBCT, the contact between the mandibular, uh, the third molar and the inferior of era nerve was, was observed in 61%, which was less than uh, the cases with contact on panorexia. So if you look at panorex, it sort of exaggerates the, 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 the picture. And this means that in, in one study, it was not possible to accurately determine whether the mandibular third molar and the inferior of Ella nerve were actually in contact based on a panorex. So you, you then need to, to map the inferior of Ella nerve using a CBCT cone beam. Uh, so there are various softwares that you can do. And the beauty is you can look at it in all direction from an axial view, uh, uh, because most of the times, uh, it, you, you see that the nerve is actually on the buccal side uh, or inferior or lingual. Uh, so the lingual side is associated with a higher incidence of, of inferior or viola nerve uh, damage. Uh, sometimes it's uh, interradicular, sometimes it's... Uh, so if you look at this image, uh, this is uh, the inferior or viola nerve canal. Uh, on this image, it's inferior. On this one, it's more on the lingual cortex. Huh? Uh, so it can get a bit more complicated. Huh? Uh, so there's actually a classification system where we classify them from class zero to all the way to class three. I will not get into this, huh? but uh, the rationale is you, you want to see whether it's apical, whether it's lingual or buccal, and whether it's two millimeters below or... So this classification is then used uh, as a way to... So it's based on CBCT, not panorex, this classification. Uh, it can even get more exciting, this classification, because look at class seven. Uh. Class seven, uh, if you are to extract this tooth, uh, you... This would be very difficult. Huh? You would almost need to open both intra oral and extra oral, divide the, you cut the crown, divide the roots, and uh, separate them gently, and you should have the right instruments. Huh? But apart from a radiological assessment, huh, uh, the other risk factors are gender, age, huh? and uh, uh, let me not get into, since we are running out of time and almost finishing, we uh, age, we know that uh, with age, there is increased bone density, hypersementosis, uh, and you are more likely to damage. That's why uh, different authors have advocated that wisdom should be, you should do disimpactions before the age of 24, 25. Uh, before root formation is, is complete. And also other risk factors, the deeper the tooth, the, the more you are more likely to, to, to damage the nerve. And uh, as I said, when the canal is lingual, uh, in fact, a Swedish study demonstrated that 24 of the 30 cases uh, of inferior of yellow nerve injury, they showed two things. Number one, a narrowed inferior alveolar nerve on CBCT and a lingual pathway. And clinically, what they found is when the mandibular 
third molar is extracted, most of the, the instrumentation is performed on the back outside. Huh? And because of this, there are many cases where the tooth comes out whilst applying the force on the lingual direction. Huh? So when you put your elevators, you are squeezing the nerve. Uh, remember the elevator is back early. And also the degree of post-operatives, the more damage to the tissues, uh, the more likely uh, you are going to damage. Uh, surgeon's experience. Uh, uh, so this is a very interesting publication and they have shown some, para they are very paradoxical results uh, uh, where inferior velar nerve injury, it developed in, in three out of 71 teeth in patients treated by surgeons between one to four year experience. Uh, and then the complication rate sort of increased uh, from for surgeons between five to nine years of experience. Uh, and then for surgeons above uh, 10 years of experience, uh, like the Professor Chizongaza, uh, the incidence was then seen to decline. Uh, and the explanation to this hypothesis is uh, because there is so much amplification of this complication during our residence training, we, we tend, uh, the inexperienced surgeon, they tend to be very, uh, very intimidated by the nerve. And then when you realize your complication rate is very small, you end up into a zone of complacence. So this uh, distribution curve applies not only for third molar surgery, but it also applies for any other dental procedures. Huh? So we should be careful and we will recover. We, we, we know that in four to eight weeks after surgery, 96% of the patients would recover, uh, uh, but uh, some patients will end up with permanent uh, paresthesia and the recovery can take up to, up to one and a half years. Huh? And uh, uh, the inf if the inferior alveolar nerve is injured, unless uh, it is displaced by bone fragments from the roof of the mandibular canal or displaced into the sockets, it will remain within the canal and regenerate. So the inferior alveolar nerve neuropathy related to third molar surgery uh, is usually temporary in most of the cases up to 20% and only permanent in 2% of the cases, uh, and unless if there is direct trauma. So the inferior alveolar canal sort of acts as a template to redirect the, the nerve. Uh, and uh, you, you'd obviously need to assess the degree of injury using either the Sedon's classification of neuropraxia, axotemesis, and the neurotemesis. So this, there are two classifications, very old classifications, Sedon's and the Sunderland to assess degree. Uh, so usually if it is a fifth degree, there is complete transection of the nerve. The nerve is cut off. Huh? So those ones, they do not recover. And uh, as you assess, you actually realize, so the assessment should be objective. Huh? So there are five assessments that you do so that you differentiate between these degrees, huh? whether there is actually neurotemesis where the nerve is cut. Because if the nerve is cut, you, 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 you cannot wait and tell your patient to, to, to just wait there. So if the nerve is cut, uh, so as you do your objective assessment, you do your two point discrimination. Uh, so we are finishing in a minute. You do a brush stroke direction, uh, your contact, your thermal testing, all these complicated tests. Uh, and uh, uh, that will tell you how to manage. Uh, but to manage, you have to be meticulous in your technique. And most of the times when you do non-surgical extraction of wisdom teeth, you are less likely going to end up with uh, damage to the inferior of viola nerve. And one important thing that our take home message for inferior of viola, normally as you are drilling, if you notice a sudden bleed, uh, we know that the inferior of viola nerve is the most superior structure in the canal. And when rotary 
instruments penetrate the canal, the bleeding will alert the surgeon that the superior part of the canal has been breached. Uh, and you know you are closer, but you can manage usually with the drugs, your, your pregabalin or these tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, uh, your dulo, uh, your duloxectin, your NSAIDs, uh, your dexamethasone steroids, uh, nutrition like vitamin B complex, laser, uh, you can do all these uh, alternative medical methods and like physio, acupuncture, home massage, surgical, you can repair. If you notice that the nerve is cut off, you, you re-anastomose you, you re anastomose the nerve, or you can put a tube to guide the nerve, or uh, you can do transplantation. Uh, and also, uh, you, there are other techniques to prevent where you cut the mesial portion. If you notice that the root is, is pass, the nerve is passing through the tooth, there is a technique described by land where you, you, you just go in like mesial angular, you cut the, like a coronectome, you cut it, but you should make sure you don't expose the, the pulp. Huh? If you expose the pulp, you do a root canal treatment or a pulpotomy. And then it's thought that after some time, the tooth will migrate. Uh, and then you come back after two to three months or four months, and then you now proceed to do your, your, your disimpaction. Huh? And the conclusion is all patients with high risk for damage to the inferior alveolar nerve must be warned of the risk of mandibular third molar surgery, and they should sign a consent. Uh, otherwise, when it happens, it's very devastating and very difficult to, to, to manage. Huh? Um, so at this stage, I will hand over to, uh, to Dr. Fiki. Thank you so much for the time. Huh? And for the patients, we have exceeded by four minutes. Huh? Uh, no, thank you, Doc. That's fine. Uh, I think it was really worth worth listening to. Um, can we just look at the chat box, Doc? Okay, so first there's a comment. Uh, it doesn't have a name, I'm not sure. But someone again is saying they'll be more careful <laughs> um, and refer more cases because we've learned <laughs> a lot. I have to agree with that. Then Dr. Moyana is asking, what has happened to the local training of maxillofacial and oral surgeons? He said there was a goal to have a maxillofacial surgeon in each of the provinces. I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that. All right, all right. Um, so uh, I will answer the second question. Um, so the, 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 there are plans to start the, the training. Uh, we submitted the a proposal and the curriculum. I'm sure within the next one year or so, uh, we should be starting. Huh? But the good thing is also we, we have many people in training outside the country. I'm sure in the next two, three years, huh, uh, there will be a substantive number of maxillofacial surgeons in the country. Huh? Uh, I know my colleague, Dr. Jaganani, is in the meeting and is in Nairobi training. Huh? Um, any other questions? Okay, thanks, Doc. I hope uh, Dr. Moyana's question is um, answered. There's another question from Dr. Mrapa. Can you see the question? Yeah, no, I can't see where the questions are. Okay, let me read it. It says, is it a wise idea to go ahead with disimpaction, which I would have otherwise referred if it has been recently associated with an abscess? Do the risk of complication remain the same if all other factors point towards a complicated extraction, for example, prox proximity of roots to the inferior of your learner? All right. So I, I, I think there are, there are two aspects that are being pointed out by the, the dentist asking the question. Number one, the issue of the protocol when it comes to if a patient presents with an abscess or infection, do we extract or do we defer? 
Um, so there are several studies that have been done to that effect. Huh? And uh, what they found out is most of the, the, most of the times if you extract the truth immediately and uh, perhaps do an IND, the outcomes are better. You end up with less long-term complications huh? like necrotizing, fasciitis, ludwigs. Huh? So the, the concept of prescribing antibiotics and waiting for two, three days for the infection to go away can be, is usually disastrous. Huh? The argument for deferring has always been local anesthesia does not work very well uh, when in settings of infections. Huh? But the intended benefit of extracting the truth outweighs the, the risk of not achieving uh, anesthesia. Particularly for elderly patients, you, you want to immediately extract, don't defer the extraction when there is an infection. And uh, should we be referring all patients, the purpose of this presentation uh, and maybe more presentations in the future years is to, to equip every dentist to be able to deal with third molar surgeries, huh? except maybe if the tooth is in the condyle. But we know that if we equip or train uh, the dentist and more surgeons, uh, the complication rate decreases uh, and we will all be more comfortable in doing some of the, of the procedures. Uh. Okay. Thank you, Doc, um, for that answer. So it seems the rest of the comments in the chat were just people saying thank you. If there's no one with the physical question, would like to thank you, Dr. Manana, for the very informative. Uh, quickly, well, quickly, Dr. Vicky, can I just quickly? I know. Yes, and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Manana, thank you very much for your very, very uh, thorough presentations. At the end of your presentation, you touched on uh, um, decoronation of impacted wisdom teeth, okay, uh, which is something that I've done a couple of times. Have there been any? studies to show whether that is a viable option you know when when you got a uh, possible risk of damaging the nerve and you just remove the crown and just close the roots in there and leave them in there yeah so so it's it's it's, it's emerging as an alternative approach huh? but the key thing is is actually patient selection huh? so there are actually many studies that have been done and they, they have shown a, a very good success rate. But the, good, the key thing, as I said, is patient selection. There should be no infection. In fact, that, that's the key thing. And also you should not perform it for horizontal teeth because as you section the, the crown, you are more likely to end up in the uh, inferior alveolar canal. And uh, you should then be monitoring the patient and come back within nine months huh? because we must because we now know that beyond nine months there is no migration and you might end up with the root ankylosis. Huh? Uh, but it's also a technique, a sensitive procedure, uh, which you, we, you would need to do it properly. Uh, but uh, it's an alternative way of protecting the nerve. Yes, I agree with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question, Dr. Chironga. Are there any more questions before we close off? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, we come to the end of our day one of the annual Congress. Thanks again to to Dr. Manana, that was great. Please, can people come again tomorrow? We'll be continuing um, with the talk on implants from Prof. Lalu, uh, who will be presenting from France. So again, it should be good. Good evening to everyone. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thanks, bye. Thanks, bye. Thank you.